Good morning. Welcome to Good News. This week we continue our Easter worship series entitled Once Jesus Got Out. This week we focus on the blessing of praise that came with Jesus as he burst out of the tomb. In the world around us, we're always being told what to value, what to give our attention to, what to value, what to praise. But today, in the, revel in the vision of St. John in Revelation, he shows us who is really worthy of praise. It's the Lamb who sits on the throne who is slain. We'll follow the order service found in our worship folder. You can always follow along on the screen up front. We'll begin on page four. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Christ is risen. He, he is, is risen, risen indeed. indeed. We are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. Christ, Christ died, died for us, all, and those who, those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Let us confess that often we have lived for ourselves, confident in the forgiveness of him who lived, died, and rose for us. Lord of life, I confess that I am by nature dead in sin, for faithless worrying and selfish pride, for sins of habit and sins of choice, for the evil I have done and the good I have failed to do. You should cast me away from your presence forever. O Lord, I am sorry for my sins. Forgive me for Jesus' sake. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. After his resurrection, Christ commanded his church to proclaim forgiveness, promising that their words were as certain as his. Therefore, by Christ's command and with his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Christ is risen. He, he is, is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Lord be with you. And also with you. We pray. O God, by the humiliation of your Son, you lifted up this fallen world from the, from the despair of death. By his resurrection to life, grant your faithful people gladness of heart and the hope of eternal joys. Through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Our first reading comes from Revelation chapter 5 and will serve as the basis for this morning's sermon. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands and ten thousands times ten thousand. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. 
Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them, saying, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. The four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. The word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be be to God. God. Please stand. The gospel comes from John 21. When a miraculous catch of fish is repeated, the disciples see the truth about Jesus. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, But that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, Friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, Throw your net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, He wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from from the shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. (coughs) Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153, but even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, ask him, Who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise be, be to, to you, O Christ. Christ. seated for the hymn of the day.
Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. This morning we give our attention to the words that are written for us in the Revelation of St. John chapter 5. This coming Saturday is the 148th running of the Kentucky Derby. Each year that's a, an event that gets quite a bit of attention from people, not just because people like to watch horses run around a track, but because people like to bet money on those horses as they run around the track. In fact, in 2021, last year, more than $300 million was bet on this single two-minute horse race. So on the off chance that any of you is thinking about placing a bet for this coming Saturday's race, I wanted to share with you some advice. In fact, this isn't just any advice. This is foolproof advice. This advice is guaranteed to pay off if you follow it very carefully. Are you ready? Here it is. If you're going to place a bet, all you have to do is bet on the winner and you will never lose. Some advice, right? Of course, the idea is that you have to bet on the winner, but the whole point is you have to place your bet before you know who the winner is going to be, right? That's how it normally works. Notice how I said normally. It works that way normally, except for when that exact advice, using those exact words, was given by, by old Biff, talking to young Biff, in the 1989 classic movie, Back to the Future 2. If you've seen that movie, you know that as old Biff went back into time and, and talked to his younger self and gave him this advice, he also gave to him a copy of the Gray's Sports Almanac, which had in it all of the results from every sports contest from 1950 to the year 2000. And so in that case, the advice, all you have to do is bet on the winner and you will never lose, is really good advice when you know the future. Of course, Back to the Future 2 is fiction. It's not real life, right? In real life, we have to place our bets ahead of time before we know the outcome of a given thing. In fact, most of the time, we probably don't even think about it as betting or refer to it as gambling, but in a certain sense, that's what it is. We have to put down on the table something of value some time, some energy, some effort, maybe, yes, some money. And then we just have to sit back and wait to see how it turns out. We are hoping, of course, that our wager pays off, that our investment yields a return. And, of course, sometimes it does, but sometimes it doesn't. And the whole point is you have to put that thing of value down on the table long before you ever know. Normally. Normally, except in the case of Easter. During this Easter season, we are talking about all of the things that got out when Jesus himself got out, all of the blessings that have been unleashed by Jesus' resurrection from the dead. And today we are specifically seeing how when Jesus got out of that empty tomb, praise got out with him. In other words, an accurate assessment of Jesus, a correct appraisal of of Jesus, a reliable calculation of the true value of Jesus got out and became obvious the second Jesus rose from the dead. Which means that no matter what we might invest in Jesus, no matter how much it is, no matter how much it is worth, we never once need to think of it as placing a bet or worry about it being some risky form of gambling. Instead, no matter what we might invest in Jesus, we can be confident it is going to pay off. As we look at these verses from Revelation 5 this morning, you better listen carefully because you are about to hear the best investment advice that you will ever receive. Maybe it doesn't seem like that to you, but that is essentially what it is. And I want to show you the verse in question that is this form of investment advice. It starts out with the word worthy. In the New Testament, the word worthy carries with it the picture of a, of a scale. 
So if you put something on one side of that scale and then you put something on the other side and that thing on the other side sort of balances out with the first thing, that, that thing is worthy. It balances out. And so in this verse, these people are telling us that no matter what we might put on the one side of the scale, no matter how much we might invest, if Jesus is on the other side of the scale, Jesus is always worthy. Jesus will always balance it out. Specifically, these people talk about investing in Jesus things like power and strength. For those problems in life that seem unsolvable, when we are at the end of our ropes and are forced to admit that we just can't handle something, far more than we would put our trust in the marvels of modern medicine or advances in science and technology or in any of our social institutions or political processes, they are telling us to entrust that power to Jesus and it will pay off. He will prove himself to be worth it. They also talk about wisdom. So when that latest, greatest, controversial, hot-button issue comes up, the thing that has everybody talking at the water cooler at work or everybody all riled up on social media, who or what is going to settle that issue for you? A best-selling author or popular podcaster? Some celebrity who has 100 million followers on Instagram or some random person who created a video and put it on TikTok? These people are telling you, and trust that wisdom to Jesus. Let him settle that issue for you and it will pay off. He will prove that he is worth it. They talk about honor and glory and praise, things that we like to have for ourselves, right? We like to make a name for ourselves. We want people to think highly of us and so it sure is easy to invest in our own accomplishments in the things that we think we can be good at from education to career, to hobbies, to appearances, whatever the case might be. But they are saying, invest instead in Jesus. Find your worth, find your value, find your recognition and praise in him, and he will prove that he is worth it. That bet will pay off. There's one item on the list I've been avoiding until now. They also mention wealth. Can we talk a little bit about wealth? Whether you make six figures or struggle to make ends meet, how do you decide where it goes? Enjoy it while you can. Spend your life trying to keep up with the neighbors or trying to impress your friends. Their advice is to invest it in Jesus. To spend generously for yourself, for your children, for the people in our community, and people around the world, not in things that will bear an immediate return or even a return at any point in this lifetime, but in things that lead to an eternal inheritance in heaven that can never be spent down. Invest even your wealth in Jesus, and that bet will pay off. He will prove himself to be worth it. That's their investment advice. Now, it's probably good to stop at this point and point out that normally this would be bad investment advice. Normally, when it comes to investing, whether literally or figuratively, the advice is diversify your portfolio, right? So when it comes to our wealth, we want some stocks, we want some bonds, we want some money in the bank, we want some commodities, maybe we even throw in some cryptocurrency just for good measure, right? We diversify our portfolio. When it comes to power and strength, we understand that not one person not one institution can handle all of that responsibility. That's why we live in a democracy, right? We spread out the power. We have checks and we have balances. When it comes to wisdom, we don't drink in information all from one source. We need to take in information from a variety of perspectives and sources and kind of synthesize and evaluate and bring it all together. And when it comes to our honor and glory and praise, we don't dedicate our entire life, every waking moment to just one thing. Instead, we get involved in a lot of different things. So if we're not as successful at one thing, maybe the other things will balance it out. But these people are saying, invest everything in just one place. Invest it all in Jesus. He is worth it. 
So it's probably worth pointing out why they say that. On what basis can they give this advice? And actually, I, I need to sort of correct something that I've been saying throughout this sermon. I've been saying that they're telling you to invest in Jesus, except in that verse that I showed you, they don't use the word Jesus. They say, worthy is the lamb who was slain. Of course, they're talking about Jesus, but they refer to him as the lamb who was slain. You think about something or someone that you'd be willing to invest in, to put all of your hopes and dreams, your life, your future, your well-being in, and maybe a lamb sort of seems like something on the bottom of the list. Weak, timid, helpless. And not only that, but this is a lamb that was slain, a lamb that's been pummeled, a lamb that's been destroyed, a lamb that has been chewed up and spit out by this life and this world. And yet in this vision, we also see that this lamb who was slain was slain for a purpose. In fact, what we see is that this lamb was slain as a purchase. Just prior to the verses that are in front of us, there was another crowd up in heaven who said this to the lamb. They said, you are worthy because you were slain and with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. You see, here's the real reason why Jesus isn't just one more thing in your life that you should spend a little bit of investment on along with everything else that is in your very diverse portfolio. It's not just that if we invest too much in things like our education or our career or our hobbies, or our appearances, that at some point we might find out that those things aren't worth it, though that probably will be the case. Even more than that, it's that at some point, all of those other things are going to find out and are going to conclude that we aren't worth them. The company will decide someone else deserves the promotion more. The coach will decide that someone else deserves more playing time. All of your social media followers will eventually decide that someone else's perfect poses with their fantastic filters on Instagram deserve more likes than yours do. No matter how much you might think you are worth, inevitably there's going to be someone somewhere who's worth more. That's what makes Jesus different. This verse allows us to picture Jesus almost as if he's the one doing the investing. In fact, picture Jesus going up to a counter at some store, ready to make a purchase, looking at all of the items that are kept there on the back wall behind the counter, and the price tag that is on each and every one of those items is exactly the same. His life, his own blood poured out into death on the cross. And so as Jesus scans all of those items and tries to assess their various values and worth, as he looks at all of the different types of products that are back there and he comes to you and it's time for him to put a value on you. Whether you are smart and successful or not, whether your life can be described as a series of successes or a string of of failures, whether you feel like you're well-liked and popular or whether you feel like you are all alone, whether you have managed in life to more or less walk the straight and narrow or whether you have made a complete mess of everything. Jesus doesn't flinch. Each and every time he says, deal, I'll take it. Each and every time he leaves his own life, he leaves his precious blood down on the counter and makes that purchase. The reason why investing in Jesus, no matter how much it might be, is worth it for you is because long ago Jesus decided for no good reason other than his love that you are worth it to him. So that really leaves just one question to be answered, and that is the question, can we believe 
the investment advice that these people are giving us in these verses? And to answer that question, we probably need to answer another question that I've been un- avoiding to this point in the sermon so far. Who are these people giving us all of this investment advice? Well, if you look at the verses in Revelation chapter 5, you'll see very clearly it's the angels. The angels are the one telling us this, but it's not just the angels who are singing this in heaven. Before this, it was four elders. I'm sorry, 24 elders and four living creatures who are saying exactly the same thing. And after this, It's going to be every creature in heaven and on earth who are saying exactly the same thing. Worthy is the lamb who was slain. Now maybe that all seems a little bit out there. Heavenly choirs singing, angels and living creatures and elders gathered around the throne and a lamb who was slain. It'd almost be like if you walked into your financial advisor's office tomorrow morning and told him that you wanted to put all of your money in one specific company's stock. Why? because some heavenly voices had told you to do so. That's why it's so important for us to know where this advice started, both in John's vision and in real life. This entire vision, if we trace it back, started right in the center, the center of all things, heaven and earth, and a throne right in that center where God the Father himself was seated, the creator of all things, the ruler over all things. And then the one sitting in the center on that throne invited someone else to join him in the center and sit on a throne right next to him. In fact, he invited that lamb who was slain to take all rule, all power, all authority in his hands until the end of time. This vision and this advice started with the, glory, with the glorification and the exaltation of God's Son, Jesus Christ. In other words, it started at Easter. In other words, for you to know that your investment in Jesus is a sure thing, you don't need to be able to hear what's going on up in heaven. And you don't need to be able to see into the future. Instead, the secret to this advice is found in a tomb that on a Sunday morning 2,000 years ago was discovered to be empty. And it was found in a locked room where Jesus appeared to his terrified disciples. And it was found on the shores of the Sea of Galilee where seven of them got to see Jesus again and have him serve them breakfast. And it was found in all the other places with all the other people who saw him alive. What makes this investment so certain is not something that's going on up in heaven, not something that's way off in the future, but something that happened right here on earth and something that happened long ago in the past. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. And so investing in Jesus would be like if you could bet on a horse race after the race has already been run, if you could pick out your lottery tickets and pick your numbers after the drawing has already taken place, no matter how much you might invest, whether it's power or strength or wisdom or honor or glory or praise or wealth, it will pay off. Jesus will prove himself to be worth it. Because Jesus got out of that tomb for you, the safest bet you can possibly make is to go all in on him. Amen. Please stand. Join with me as we confess our common Christian faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated.
We join in prayer. Worthy are you, O Lord, to receive the praise and, thanks and thanksgiving of your people for sending your Son as the Lamb to ransom us by his blood and make us a kingdom and priests in your service. Lend your blessing to your church that all we endeavor in your name may be in accord with your will and accomplish your holy purpose. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Holy Lord, you are holy and you make us holy in Christ. Give to us strength in the face of temptation, courage in the face of fear, comfort in time of distress, and resolve in the face of persecution. Help us to abound in hope in every circumstance through faith in Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Blessed Lord, all things are yours, and you have richly supplied us with the blessing of time, with talents and abilities, with the gift of labor and the income it provides. Receive our thanks for all your gifts and accept our gifts and our service as part of the worship of our hearts and our sacrifice of praise. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. To you, O Father, who sits upon the throne, and to the Lamb, by the power of the Holy Spirit, be all blessing, honor, glory, and might, now and forever. Amen. Once again, thanks for joining us today, whether that's in person or online. At this time, take a moment to let us know that you are here either by scanning the QR code found on the back of your worship folder or by going to goodnewslc.org slash connect. If you'd like to give an offering in support of our ministry, you can do so at goodnewslc.org slash give. Please stand. Almighty God, grant to your church the Holy Spirit and the wisdom that comes from above. Let nothing hinder your word from being freely proclaimed to the joy and edifying of Christ's holy people, so that we may serve you in steadfast faith and confess your name as long as we live. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Christ is risen. He is, he is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Please be seated for the closing hymn.
Once again, good morning and welcome to you all. What a, a blessing to gather here in God's house as we continue to celebrate Christ's resurrection from the dead. So as perhaps you've noticed, uh, this morning's order of service was a little bit abbreviated because we are excited to be sharing uh, with our congregation the ministry plan for our coming year. So what we are going to do is take just a, a two to three minute stretch break. We certainly invite everyone to stick around, whether you're a member of Good News or not, but we'll take a couple minutes uh, break to give you a chance to stretch if you need to. And uh, during that time, the members of our church council are also going to be handing out uh, that ministry plan along with some additional information to uh, the member families of our congregation. So you're welcome to stand up and stretch uh, if the kids need uh, a little bit of a head start on the snack that's in the, in the fellowship room, that's okay too. Um, but we'll get started in just a couple of minutes and the presentation then should last roughly 20 to 25 minutes and then we'll get started with our normal Sunday school and Bible class as close to 1015 as we possibly can. Please take a look at uh, the other announcements that are in the service folder. Otherwise, thank you again for being with us today. Uh, God's blessings to you throughout the week.